All right. I will attempt to uh, to not have so much time at the beginning of class. We wasted a whole like 45 seconds of your class time. I will try not to have that happen in the future. Um, there's a button here that does lights, lighting control, chalkboard. Yeah, that's the one I wanted. Sweet. Welcome to M1800. You guys having fun yet? This is my first lecture of the term. How about you guys? No. Yeah, it sucks to be you guys. <laughs> um, so this, I, I, I have given this lecture at least twice a year for the last 17 years. So you might think I'm pretty good at it. Or you might think that I kind of suck at it because he's been doing the same damn thing for 17 years, twice a year. He, now, I, actually, it's different every single time. And this term, I'm trying something even differenter. So feedback. Who, who's an electrical engineering major? Anybody? Really? In the building where they live. And none of you are. Um, well, so they, they study feedback, right? That, that microphone echo thing that was going on, it was sort of like, feed, it almost got to the feedbacky thing where it made a resonance and it was really loud. So feedback is good. If it sucks and you don't tell me, it'll continue to suck. Now, if it sucks and you do tell me and I don't feel like changing, it'll still continue to suck. Sorry about that. I'll try not to though. This class is about manufacturing, right? Everybody knows that? And so today we're gonna to talk about what is manufacturing and why it's important. And I'm gonna start with the why it's important. And it was, I was in a classroom very similar to this. Actually, it was Higgins 216. So who's been in Higgins 216, right? So I was sitting up there in Higgins 216, about a third of the way back, sort of to the speaker's right. So right about, their um, picture, what's your name? Ava, right about where Ava was sitting, except in a different classroom. I was sitting there, it was a seminar, it was about 30 years ago. It was about 30 years ago, I was sitting there, I was a new graduate student, I had, I had actually already retired, it was pretty cool. I called it tuna fish retired, as long as all I wanted was tuna fish sandwiches, I had enough money. Therefore, I was retired because retirement is everything about state of mind, nothing to do with money, as long as there's enough money. So anyway, I retired. I was like, well, I mean, you can only make tuna fish sandwiches for so much of the day. So I went back to grad school, came back to WPI because I lived right around the corner. So that was, of course, the place I'd go. And I got a TA position to be a TA in manufacturing engineering. So, of course, I picked manufacturing engineering because even retired people don't like to waste money. So... I'm sitting in that right where Ava is, except in the other classroom. I'm sitting there and there's some speaker droning on, as speakers do. Who's been to a seminar before? Who's been to a seminar in that room? Nobody? Some of you will. They, I, I couldn't tell you who the, talker, who the talker was, who the speaker was. I couldn't tell you what the topic was, except it was about manufacturing. I was sitting there and I figured out, holy shit everything is made by manufacturing everything in our entire society comes from manufacturing even anybody eat fruit this morning could you have had that fruit without manufacturing i mean the fruit could have existed without manufacturing i get that and somebody could have had it but not you unless it was an apple tree in your backyard and i don't think apples are ripe yet in, in Worcester. So you probably wouldn't have been eating an apple from your backyard today. So manufacturing causes everything. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. I should actually get into manufacturing. I mean, I'm doing it because it's free and they're paying for my schooling and I get to do something. And I get, actually get to become a consultant in manufacturing. I get to work with big like fortune. I think, I don't really understand this fortune list thing. Does anybody understand it? It's like, oh, you know, Fortune 100 company. Oh, it's a Fortune 500 company. It's a Fortune 1000 company. There's like Fortune 5000 companies too. I think they go up to 5000 in their listing of companies. But this one was right around 50 on that list at the time I was working for him as a consultant, right? So it worked for big companies. 
I've worked with small startups that are just like a guy thinking he's got a product that he can sell to people. Uh, and so I get to do a whole bunch of stuff because I was sitting where Ava was sitting. It's Ava, right? With an A? Okay. Not Eva. Got it. Okay. I don't want to have been saying it wrong for like half the class and you're just like, she doesn't even know my name. You're not the only one he knows. I, I got to learn another name. Um, hat. Yeah. Elliot, Ava. Okay. By the end of the term, I will still be asking you your names. <laughs> but at least I make, I had a professor um, here at WPI when I was an undergraduate. First day of class, everybody sit down. He said, is this where you want to sit for the rest of the term? It's a, and he's like, because if it's not, get up and move to where you want to sit for the rest of the term. So like, if your friend's sitting over there and you want to sit next to your friend, get up and go sit next to them. Everybody settles back down and he takes a picture of each section of the class. The next day he had those printed out, blown up, big sized. He passed them around with a Sharpie. It says, write your name next to your face. And within two weeks, he knew everybody, knew their names, knew them by sight. I'm not him. <laughs> I will remember you. I will know your face. I will remember what project you worked on. I will remember if I thought you were funny. I will remember if you annoyed me. But unless you're like one of 10 people, I probably won't remember your name. Unless, all right, here's a, if you want me to though, just say it over and over again. Or if you're named the same as one of my kids. Any Michelles? No Michelles? Okay. Any Emilys? No Emilys, no Michelles. So yeah, you guys are out of luck. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'm sitting there. I realize manufacturing is cool. So that's when I actually got excited about it. So like 30 years ago, for 30 years, I've had this level of excitement about manufacturing. That's pretty amazing to me even. Uh, but why is it, right, so it makes everything. What else is unique about manufacturing? Can anybody tell me something? Besides the fact that it makes everything we have, what else makes manufacturing worthy of study? Yeah, what's your name? Uh, my name's Anna. Anna. Yeah. Hannah, that's too bad because my daughter's best friend's name is Anna. So that, I might've had a hook there. <laughs> Hannah. Um, nope, I got it. First employee I hired at uh, the first manufacturing company that I bought, her name was Hannah. There you go. I might remember your name. Um, but manufacturing uh, is worth studying because uh, there's a lot of different ways to make things. So there are a lot of different ways. So it certainly requires study because you can't know manufacturing if you don't study a bunch of different ways to do things. So is that, was there more? I interrupted yeah. you. So studying it allows you to be better at it so you don't waste material. Keep going if you got more. Um, and not wasting material is good for a lot of reasons. Not wasting material is good for a lot of reasons, right? We can all agree that not wasting material is good for a lot of reasons. Not wasting all that carbon that we put in the atmosphere would be good, right? What do you got? So, so manufacturing is useful to study because if you want to be designing stuff, it's pretty cool if you could design stuff that somebody could make. And, and making stuff is a big part of manufacturing, right? Can we agree to that? Um, so who, who here came to WPI because they want to design stuff when they grow up? So that's about three quarters of the hands. Who here came to WPI because they want to manufacture stuff? Who, 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 all right. So that's some of those, some of those people put up both hands, right? Some people want to design a manufacturer. That's fair. So manufacturing, studying manufacturing is important if you're going to be a designer. And I totally agree. Actually, I think the, the tagline on the website that we use for this class, me1800.com, the tagline at the top of that website is making engineers that understand how to make things. Right. Then my goal might. So I, what I manufacture engineers. Right. So my goal is to manufacture engineers that understand how to make things. 
And part of the reason I do that is because I also own a manufacturing company where we do work for engineers who design stuff and they send us the designs. And sometimes you just want to like crawl under something, right? You like, and who's, who's ever heard the customer's always right? <laughs> that ain't true. <laughs> One of the things we'll talk about when we, when we'll talk about quality, uh, quality in manufacturing next week. One of the things we'll talk about when we talk about quality is that it's not always giving the customer what they want or what they ask for rather. Sometimes it's giving them what they needed. Uh, and so there's, so, so and I, and I actually define quality as giving the customer what they need when they need it. Um, and we'll, we'll, but we'll do a whole lecture about defining quality and talk about that. Manufacturing is super cool though. Studying it is important because you guys want to make stuff. You know you want to make stuff. You wouldn't have come to WPI if you didn't like making stuff, probably. Is anybody that came to WPI but hates making stuff? Not that you're willing to admit in this crowd. <laughs> So here's, here's the thing though, that's a cool part about manufacturing and certainly we want to study manufacturing because of that. That is not what gets me excited about manufacturing. I mean, it makes everything, so it's kind of cool. That's super cool. Who does manufacturing? Who's ever been to a manufacturing facility where manufacturing was done? About half the class have been to me. So who does the manufacturing? Um, What's your name? Uh, my name is Pryor. It's usually on my shirt. Pryor? Yeah, like the word. Pri like, not after, but Correct. prior. Yes. Well, so I was wondering, <laughs> I, I was actually wondering if the prior was the son of the bishop. Like the prior that, that is like the head of the abbey. I guess that's the abbot. The prior is the head of the priory. <laughs> your name I will remember, especially if you write it on your shirt every day. <laughs> prior. So, what, 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 oh, who does manufacturing? That was my question. So, I couldn't even remember the question. So, I got so distracted by the name. Sometimes it's people doing manufacturing. All right, so people do manufacturing. Do I spell that even right? No. It's the, the E goes on the other side of the L, right? So I do, I, I do kind of like when I have a classroom with a whiteboard because then the first person in the class that points out a spelling mistake I make, I throw them the red marker and say, you have to do the red squigglies for the rest of the term. <laughs> <laughs> but if I put the L here and then the E over here, yeah, people. I, it, I often know I didn't spell it right because it doesn't look right. <laughs> my, my oldest daughter has never made a spelling mistake, except for once. And it was like in fourth grade. And I said, hey, you don't usually get spelling mistakes on tests. She said, that's the way the teacher wrote it on the board the first time. <laughs> <laughs> she must have a photographic memory. I don't, I don't know. We've never tested it, but that, that's the only explanation for that. <laughs> People do manufacturing, right? Even when it's a robot doing the manufacturing, like physically assembling the thing or putting the, taking the thing out, or even when it's a robot, it's people involved, right? People had to program the robot. People had to decide what the robot, I suppose when Skynet takes over. We won't need the people anymore. But up until Skynet takes over, we'll need the people. So has anybody ever worked at a business before? You know what the hardest part of working at a business or actually running a business is? The people. The people. Right. So I love manufacturing because people do manufacturing. But it is also one of the hardest parts. Here's the thing, though. So, and we'll, we'll get into sort of technical definitions of manufacturing in a minute, stuff like that. Here's the thing. Manufacturing, the, the simple basic act of manufacturing is taking some raw material and changing it by adding value to it. So we take this raw material and we modify it in some, some manner 
to make it into something that has more value than it had before. So we take a raw material, we turn it into something else. We have now created wealth that didn't exist before. So you can dig wealth up out of the ground. You could plant a seed, wait for it to germinate, wait for it to grow and harvest it to create new wealth. I would argue that that's just a form of manufacturing. It's just you're using dirt instead of machine tools. But manufacturing, people do work. New wealth is created. And do you know who gets the wealth? The rich capitalists like me. <laughs> it's, I mean, that's partially true, right? The person who created the company, the person who invested their capital to make the company happen, they do get a bunch of that wealth. But in reality, 50% of revenue in most manufacturing companies goes to the people who did the work as their, as their salary. So that new wealth that we just created, it gets distributed to a community. Because that new wealth comes in, say Pryor works at my manufacturing company, he, and he gets, he's a, a fairly decent machinist, let's say. Fairly decent machinist in this area, he's making 100 grand a year, easy. He's driving a fancy car, going out to, to brunch on Sundays, going out to do bowl. I do bowl. You do. So he's going bowling, he's hanging out at the bowling alley. Maybe Thursday night he goes down to the pub, hangs out with his buds. And what does he, what does he pay for all that with? The wealth that we just created. And that wealth then goes through his community. So this is why I get excited about manufacturing. It's not because it makes everything, because I mean, it does. But even if we didn't have manufacturing, well, there probably wouldn't be as much, as much of us as many of us. And we probably wouldn't, well, we wouldn't have all this cool stuff. We wouldn't have had to figure out where the echo was coming from at the beginning of class. Um, so that's what gets me super excited about manufacturing is because the people that do the work actually get to keep some of that wealth that was just created. And so if you think about society and, and economies and things like that, and we, and especially these, like, what's, what's the, what's the big word on the news these days? Recession, right? And everybody's worried about, I mean, there's recession and there's Trump suing the government. So there's the two big things on the news, I guess. So if we're in a society, who, who's heard of service economies? Who's heard the term service economy? Who thinks the United States has a service economy? A lot of people would say that. Now we have a service economy that's based on manufacturing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue. But if we only had, if we purely had a service economy, if we transition, if we stop doing manufacturing, if we just do service jobs, that's just trading, right? You trade time for money in a service job. That's all you're doing. Some people are good at trading. Some people are less good at trading. In a society where the only way wealth transfers from one person to another is by trading, all of the wealth goes to the top because people are good at trading. In a society where you can create new wealth and have it filter up through all the people, wealth is unlimited and we can continue to grow and society gets better and the world is a happy place and we sing Kumbaya and all that stuff. That's what gets me excited about manufacturing. Is anybody more excited about manufacturing now than they were at the beginning of class? Sweet. Let's go home then. My job is done. My, my objective, so I'll, I'll, have, I'll have an objective for each of these lectures. Um, and my objective today was to get you excited about wanting to do the class. So we're gonna have to talk about some more stuff, right? Because you guys are nerdy, detail-y kind of people, probably. So year, years ago, I was at a seminar. It was a guy came in to, to teach faculty how to it better interact with people with learning challenges, or, or not really learning challenges, more living challenges. Um, and so he, he says, when I go to a uh, liberal arts school and give this talk, I'm looking at the audience and I'm looking for the one or two people in the audience that have Ashburgers. And it says, when I come to a tech school like this, I'm looking at the audience and I'm looking for the one or two that don't. <laughs> right. So we're all special in our own ways. <laughs>
Um, so we'll get into some. So what? So I'm excited about manufacturing because it creates new wealth, wealth that didn't exist, and it goes to those people. And it's those people that make society happen, right? If, if all the wealth just went to the capitalist who started the company, the company would fail because no people would want to do work for them, right? So it balances. Even, I, I studied nuclear engineering when I was an undergraduate here at WPI. And it's kind of like a boiling water reactor. Anybody, anybody know how a boiling water reactor works? You do? So, so it's actually the, the water the water that slows down the neutron when it's coming out of that fuel pellet and it's got to hit another fuel pellet and then it's got to cause another reaction in that next fuel pellet. If it's moving too fast, it just shoots right through. So the water is the moderator. It slows it down. And when it slows it down enough, the reaction gets bigger. The reaction creates heat. So the water gets hotter. It's, um, it, as it gets hotter, it starts to boil, right? Because that's what happens to water when it gets hotter hotter enough. As it boils, the bubbles get bigger in the water. The air in the bubble does not slow down the neutrons. The bigger the bubbles get, the less moderator you have around the fuel. And they don't slow down, the reaction cools down. So it's self-regulating. And so, you know, pay it, manufacturing companies, stuff like that, it has to be self-regulating like that. Because if you don't pay the people enough, they won't know. It's probably a bigger cycle there. Uh, anyway, that's what gets me excited. But what is, when we come down to, all right, so if we're excited about manufacturing because it's good and because we know we're going to have to use it in the future to make the stuff we design, then what is manufacturing? What is it? Yeah. Uh, making stuff. All right, so it's making stuff. Um, you know, there are slides for all of my lectures. Occasionally, we'll look at one or two of them. But the, the stuff on the slides sort of mimics what I talk about. So, um, and so because of that, let me switch the view here to make the slide smaller. This one. You guys can't see that, but the people at home can. Maybe. This one. Ah, just make it be me. Nope, just make it be me. Just me. Make this one be solo. There, now it's just me. For the people watching from home. Making stuff. Is that, is that it? Is manufacturing making stuff? Yep. I mean, to add to that, you typically make things from a model or design. Okay, making stuff, let me get rid of people. I mean, we can't get rid of all the people, but making stuff. Making stuff from a model or design. And it's usually stuff that is useful in some way. Making useful. Making useful stuff from a model or design. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> you could get red chalk and take care of the squigglies. Making useful stuff. So we're going to do it from a model or design using work instructions. So we want to make useful stuff from a model or design using work instructions. Uh, using existing raw materials. Making, making stuff, making useful stuff out of stuff, other stuff. Making useful stuff out of stuff from a model or design using work instructions 
with out losing your shirt. Making useful stuff out of out of stuff from work from models or designs using work instructions without losing your shirt. Yeah, when you run out of money, then you got to give people your shirt to pay for the stuff. So he said cost effectively. I said without using losing your shirt. It's it's um, paraphrasing. Is this manufacturing? I, I will stipulate 100% manufacturing includes this. Is this manufacturing? Perhaps. I think, I think we need to narrow it more, though. But, but, it, I'm, but I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Some of the stuff here may be too focused, but I think we're missing a focal item. You could be making multiple things, but you don't have to be. You need to make it for someone. For the other kind of for customer. Now, if you look this up in the dictionary, it'll say sort of like producing goods from raw materials and stuff like that. Well, producing implies there's a consumer, right? When they use that word producing. Manufacturing, maybe. Well, you won't keep doing it if you don't do it without losing your shirt. But you could do it for a little while. Right? I mean, how many years did Amazon lose? I mean, they're not, I mean, not directly a manufacturing company when they started, but they lost money for a long time. They didn't really lose money. They found new investors to give them more money. It was just a different way to get revenue. But I don't, so we do this, right? Doing, it, doing manufacturing better, it's a lot easier if you have a model or design. It's, it's like um, getting in the airplane, turning on the autopilot without programming a destination and just press go, right? If you don't have, a, if you don't have that design, you don't know what your destination is. So it's certainly easier Making stuff out of stuff for people is manufacturing. How do you know the customer wants your stuff? They may come to you, but sometimes they come to you angry. So I don't know that just the fact that they're coming to you tells you they want your stuff. It, it is, yeah, people, people spend a fortune on forecasting and focus groups and trying to figure out what people are going to want. And you're right. You only know it after the fact. How is it that you know? Often. Often we're making something that solves a problem. The way the manufacturer knows, I, I think you got the answer. They tell you in a very specific way. They pay you. Making stuff out of stuff for, uh, for customers who pay you. So what if you don't want to get paid? Some people don't want to get paid. Some people are, you know, they got enough tuna fish, they're good to go. They don't need to get paid. What if you don't want to get paid? Are you a manufacturer still? No, but you can be a maker, right? As we, we, all, we all know about maker spaces and going to the maker space and stuff. There are some maker spaces that actually let you do manufacturing. Most of them forbid it. In most that I know of, I, I'm not a maker space um, aficionado, but a lot of maker spaces don't let you, certainly not at scale. Like if you make something and sell it on Etsy or something, they probably don't care. But if you're doing batches, batches of production and stuff, most makerspaces kick you out because that's not what they're there for. They're there for the joy of making, not for the manufacturing. So manufacturing is making useful stuff, hopefully, 
It doesn't have to be useful. Right? There's, who's, who's seen manufactured goods that sell that are not useful? We all have, right? So it doesn't have to be useful. You have to convince people they want it. Marketing's not that hard. You can convince people they want almost anything. Making stuff out of stuff for customers who pay you. Though, who pay you. That's manufacturing. All right, so we know what manufacturing is. We know why manufacturing is important, right? Because it makes everything. Because we like to design stuff and we'd like that stuff to be able to get made. And the people who do the making get money so that they can give money to other people in their community and the whole community can thrive and there's new schools and the world goes around. If we stop doing manufacturing, I mean, we all have seen, who's, who's ever been to an old mill town? Any, anybody from Maine? Where from? Sonco. Say again? Saco. Saco. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever been up to Millinocket? Yeah. Were you ever there when it was a big mill town? Yeah. yeah. When the mill closed, things go to hell. I used to live in Millinocket. I actually helped build an automation system that, well, anyway. <laughs> The, uh, the union workers at the mill didn't like us non-union contractors building the automation system that was eliminating jobs. Um, and then even with the automation system, the mill failed. All right, uh, making stuff out of stuff for customers who pay you. That's manufacturing. It's important because we want to make stuff or we want to design stuff at least. And if we know how it's going to get manufactured, it's... So what's, what's the risk of not understanding how it's going to get manufactured when you design stuff? What's the real big risk? Yeah. Maybe it won't get manufactured. It gets expensive. It gets expensive. Um, we'll talk about this when we get to the design lectures near the middle of the class. But um, I have a funny story from, an, uh, say, a company that makes large flying objects. They're identified though, they're not unidentified. So large flying objects, they've been making the same large flying objects for, I mean, versions of the same flying objects for decades and decades. Sometimes there's design changes, right? Some, they, um, they had a, it was an instrument panel, goes in the cockpit, and there was a, a gauge underneath that needed periodic adjustments. And so to do the adjustment, they had to take the instrument panel cover plate off and then they could go in there, turn a screwdriver. Actually, a really bright uh, maintenance person suggested a design change of, well, if you put a little hole right at this spot in that cover plate, we could have a little plug in the hole. If you put a little hole right there, we could just reach the screwdriver through, make the adjustment, and it would take two minutes instead of 45 minutes. So they give the young engineer the task of take the existing design, add a hole, right at this spot, so the screwdriver can fit through, so you can turn a screw, so you can adjust the gauge. Sounds pretty simple, right? That's the kind of jobs they give young engineers. You know what they call you guys to? What's that? Um, I've never heard them called that, but I have heard kids with CAD. Because <laughs> you guys are good at CAD, CAD software, so kids with CAD. Kids with CAD will often um, See, so who, who knows what a tolerance is? Good. So tolerances are, so for anybody that didn't just raise your hand, the tolerance is how much the manufacturer is allowed to screw up when you give them the design. That's in a nutshell. How, how much of a mistake could I make and have it still be a good part? So, I mean, he doesn't know. Nobody taught him. So he draws the thing. He's like, well, I guess it needs to be plus or minus a thousandth on location because, I mean, that's what we normally do. And, uh, I mean, well, the diameter has got to be, you know, at least, you know, plus or minus a, a thousandth also, you know. So, so this is a stamped piece of sheet metal. It goes into a machine and ka -chunk, it's done. And what they needed to do was they needed to add a little, another pin in the die that was doing the stamping so that when it did ka -chunk, there was one more little hole there but he drew the design change with machining tolerances. 
for 10 years. They stamped it, ka-chunk. What's the manufacturing time on ka-chunk? 47 seconds, maybe put the thing in, take the thing out, put it in the box. They ka-chunked it. Then they brought it to another building, put it in the $150,000 machine tool, located it with all their fancy gauges, and it went, whoop, to drill a hole. Because the new hole in the design change had machining tolerances. So yeah, not understanding how it's going to get made can make it cost more. Years before somebody's like, why the hell do we drill this hole when everything else is stamped? Like, I don't know, what's the hole for? It's to stick a screwdriver through to adjust a gauge. It's clearance for the head of a screwdriver. Yeah, so... So yeah, that was so. Who, who? It was somebody over here that that said we want to learn manufacturing because we're designing stuff. Was you right, gray shirt? Was it you? Maybe. Somebody, somebody over here. <laughs> well, anyway, you gray shirt. What's your name? Next to Ava. Jacques. Jacques. Jacques Ava. Prior. Somebody else. Um, uh, uh, Hannah. Yeah, I'm gonna remember Hannah. You have to wear that green shirt every day now, though. <laughs> All right. So, what we okay. Who wants to learn manufacturing? How are we going to learn manufacturing here at WPI? Besides listening to me talk. I mean, it's fun to listen to me talk. Yeah, go ahead. We're going to go to the machine shops in Washburn. Um, and so... Actually, I think if I go, ah, no, don't play the stupid movie, the video. Yeah. You might want to watch, there's some cool videos in here. Yeah, I was, I was used to do this thing where I talk about how manufacturing is the oldest profession. Um, yeah, we don't need this one right now. We're going to get to that in a second. Where was the slide I was looking for? I don't know. I thought there was a slide that said something that I wanted to, a point I wanted to make there. So we're going to go to the machine shop. Oh, I know. There is, the slide's in that presentation. It's hidden. I hid the slide so it wouldn't show up today. The slide is there. It is. So raise your hand if you have read the course description for this class. Raise your hand if you have read the course description for this class in the last month. Last week, last day. Why did you read the course description yes, within the past day? I read your announcement. Yeah, I told you guys to yesterday, didn't I? <laughs> I said, read the course description before you come to class. <laughs> so any, anybody else read it because they read the announcement? There's a link to it there, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. You read it to figure out what the class was. I used to pick classes by going to the bookstore, looking at the book titles, and then seeing what that book, what class that book was for, and then saying, oh, I think I want to take that class. Can't do that anymore, right? They don't have shelves with books anymore at the bookstore. It's weird. You had your hand up. Um, you've got, but you've got it open right now in front of you. Yep. What's the most common word in the course description? Manufacturing. Manufacturing. What's the second most common word in the course description? It's either engineering or science. 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 And the third one then is engineering. Yeah. yeah. And then after that comes CNC machining. Probably. Yeah. CNC machining and prototyping. Students are in there, yeah. <sighs> we would do it without the students, but we tried that for a couple of years and it really sucked. <laughs> um, so manufacturing, engineering, and science. So we're gonna talk about manufacturing, engineering, and science in the class. Um, what's the difference between engineering and science? Could you be a good engineer without understanding science? Could you be a good scientist without understanding engineering? Maybe. Depends on what kind of science it is. But but you can't be an engineer without understanding the science behind it, right? 
And so the science is sort of the, the how of how it happens. And the engineering is the how-to of how it happens. If, if, and we'll, so we're talking about that. We're talking about the differences. We're, and when we study manufacturing science, we're going to study modeling manufacturing pro processes, right? And I promise it's probably spelled correctly on my slide. Maybe. <laughs> we're just, so modeling. So we're going to, and, and so we model stuff so we can better understand it. So we're going to do that in the class. Uh, we're going to go to the manufacturing labs. Who's been to the bookstore? Did anybody get a kit? There was a few kits left. The rest of the kits are back ordered. So we're not going to start the in-person machining part of the labs right away. Um, I think next week we'll have the, the kits at the bookstore um, with all of the pieces in them. Um, next week, we are going to get started doing some of the programming part of programming the CNC machine tools. And, you, and I'll give you information. You don't have to worry about it over the weekend. Um, I'll give you some information about that beginning of next week so you can get started. You can actually install it on your own computer as long as you don't have one of these. Um, but if you do have one of these, there's a server where you can log in and, and do it as a web-based thing. Um, so you, you can use it from, you could actually use it from your phone. I don't recommend it. Um, but you could, it's a web-based thing, so you can do it with a Mac. Uh, but if you have a PC or a PC laptop, you can do that. It's running on all the computers in um, Washburn 107, 108, and 105. Those are all connected there. That's the manufacturing labs. We're going to have lab. We'll talk more about that next week and what I want you to do next week. Next week. But um, we are going to spend some time in the labs. And everybody, every day in lab. So there's four sections in the class. There are. There's four sections of the class. Section one has lab on Mondays and Wednesdays from three to five. So if you have lab Mondays and Wednesdays, you don't have to remember your section number. I will remember. But, but you'll have lab Mondays and Wednesdays from three to five. Section two is Tuesday, Thursday morning from nine to 11. Section three is one to three on Tuesday, Thursdays. And then you get when section four is, right? So you're going to have lab twice a week. In, in the lab, except not next week. We're not gonna start next week because we don't have all the kits for everybody. So we're gonna push it back a week. Twice a week, you should, in each instance of being in the lab, my objective is that you touch a machine tool. Sometimes it doesn't happen. You should certainly touch a machine tool each week in a lab. Um, and so if that's not happening, let me know, because it just means that our, it doesn't mean there's anything necessarily wrong, but our scheduling is screwed up. And so, if, and, and sometimes the PLAs don't tell me, sometimes the students don't say anything, so the PLAs don't even notice. Um, and we do use peer learning assistance, PLAs, to actually do the teaching in the labs. There'll be three undergraduate students that are in charge of your lab section. One of them in each lab section probably took the class for the first time in D-term last year, and they're learning how to be a PLA. So they're there with you. They know a little bit more than you, but not a lot more. Um, and so, and the way it works is, if you ask the PLA a question and they don't know the answer, they ask one of the other PLAs. If they don't know the answer, then they find one of the staff members and ask them. So there's, there's usually not a staff member present in the facility, but they're on call. I'm at my office is right off the lab. I'm usually in my office. So they come get me. And usually we figure out that the problem is that the loose nut behind the keyboard screwed up the instructions. And, uh, and we fix the instructions and then the class moves on. So we're going to do that. There are some safety issues or safety concerns, not issues, in the manufacturing labs. So the forces and energy around the machine tools can be excessive. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the motor that drives, that, so there's a motor, it turns a screw, drives a spindle up and down. So they generate thousands of pounds of thrust up and down. So you don't want to have your hand underneath it, right? Plus, it's the tool's spinning, and there's going to be bloody chunks going all different directions if you put your hand underneath it, which is why the spindle stops when you open the door. Safety interlocks. Um, so there's things like that. But there's, there's, there are machines that do not. There are machines in the lab that don't have safety interlocks. There are drill presses, band saws. There's some manual machine tools in there. And so you got to take some safety precautions in there. 
Um, this weekend, to get a jump start on the labs, if you go to the website mfelabs.org, so mfelabs.org, and follow the steps to become a basic user. And it's a series of really poorly worded quizzes. And I mean, really poorly worded quizzes. You do have unlimited attempts. Try to think what the right answer would be. The worst of the quiz questions we deleted last year. The really bad ones that stayed, stayed because I wrote the question and you know, ideas are like babies. Everybody loves their own. <laughs> so so I, I recognize that some of the questions suck, but they are intended to make you think. So try to think, don't just guess the answers. Okay. It's, you totally could get through by just guessing the answers. It's not the right, right tool. So become a basic user of the labs. That'll get you well going next week. Uh, when you're in the labs, you need to wear shoes that cover your feet. So like, well, here. For the people watching from home, because I used to be able to lift my leg up, but not anymore. You need to wear shoes that cover your feet. Ooh, that smells. You want to wear not loose clothing, right? If you're wearing a suit coat, maybe take it off. Hang around something. Who's got their keys on one of these? So if you have your keys on one of these, and I have mine, see? These are my WPI keys. It's on my little WPI lanyard. Make sure that that is tucked in your pocket all the way so that it doesn't get sucked into the machine. Who has long hair? So you want to tie it up? Maybe put it in a little bun or just at least tie it back, right? Or you can shave it off. It's up to you. <laughs> I wore that thing for an hour just to set up that joke. You better laugh. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how you people with hair do it. That thing is it's hot. It's like wearing a hat. You guys should all shave. One, I think you look fabulous with it on. Thank and you. Two, it's also a wig, so it is much worse than actual hair. Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, people said I looked like uh, the, the cartoon, uh, the Thunder the Barbarian cartoon guy. Um, but I, I prefer British rock star. <laughs> Love to ride in the Jaguar. So that's what I got for today. We're going to have class again Tuesday next week, right? Tuesday next week. And Tuesday next week, we'll talk about how to get in the labs and what to do. But if you get the um, safety quiz done, the become a basic user thing, that'll be helpful. And broadcast.